<laughs> Welcome back. What's good, homies? Welcome to the Drafts and Drafts podcast. I'm Joe, a.k.a. Sultan. This is Dave, a.k.a. Disaster. Today's Wednesday, July 30th. We're one day away from August, which is redraft season. But before we do get to redraft podcasts, today we're going to teach you guys why you suck at making dynasty trades. And we're going to be going through the art of the deal. But before we're we back, do- baby. We are fucking back. We're back. Yeah. Classic. I was late. I was late. But that's it. No, that back. was perfect. That was perfect. We are fucking back. You know, classic Dave and Joe taking a three week break after we dropped the biggest episode we've had all summer. We take a three week break. Um, but Dave, what's going on? How you doing? Anything new going on in the world? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things going on personally. Uh, we're looking for a new role. We're looking for a new job. We're, we're in our pre-seed race for vaults. There's just a lot of stuff going on. And it's like, we are in draft season, baby. So this is, uh, to me, probably the best time of year. If you're in fantasy football, uh, there's nothing better than like August, really August one kicks it off, uh, to, to, to be in fantasy football. Absolutely. We got, we should up our streams to, instead of once a, once a week, we should get them. Once a day, if we can. Um, we need to do two days, morning and night, morning and night. <laughs> Deliver. You read my fucking mind. Um, but yeah, I, I, nothing really new on my end. Tons of golf coming off yeah, in my playoffs in my league. Shot a 39 today. I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Every time I I swear to Christ almighty, when I swing the club and I look up and it's a straight shot, I'm always surprised. Doesn't matter what club I'm using. I'm still surprised and surprised. shocked. And it's like, but it's like half my shots now instead of one out of every 10. But well, uh, you know the drill, Dave. Before we get into why everybody else sucks at trading except for you and I, let's get to a draft review. Tell me you got something tasty on hand. Tell me you got something juicy. Last day of July, what do you got for me? Well, I got two. I got a shout out. So oh, shout out. Uh, I, had, I, had a, I had a garage beer uh, oh. before we jumped on. Uh, garage beer in the attic? Or the uh, yeah, little, little, in the mud room? Garage beer. Uh, garage beer is owned by the Kelsey's. And so my wife got to meet Jason this week. She pitched him on the pod. No way. That's yeah. awesome. She's got a nice little picture out there meeting Jason Kelsey. She's the she's the craft beer buyer for Walmart. So um she got to meet him, which is cool. And Travis on the on the Zoom. But no, today we have a little 12 year anniversary treehouse. Uh damn, hold that up to the camera, bro. Banger. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. I got hold it up closer. Put it closer. Got lights going on. You're not gonna see it. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. Fuck. What are we doing? you you do, do do less. Do All right, now you're doing too much. <laughs> PPOP. <laughs> All right, awesome. Nice. Well, uh, I was gonna go treehouse, but I've already had like four beers tonight. So I was like, I don't wanna one, I'm not gonna be able to fully appreciate the flavor that is part of Treehouse Flavor Town. And two, I'm trying not to black out. So I went with yet another beer gifted to me by Boom Boom Boom, Brian Boom from our uh from the the merman manager it's called the talia pick me up hazy india india hazy ipa <laughs> oh my uh, god We're gonna, <laughs> gonna be an episode for the it is a uh magnificent aztec orange and pink can um it's a six and a half percent alcohol beer let's get a live crack i heard you crack it prematurely in the background classic dave going premature gotta get it early oh i got a juicy big big crack uh cheers dave love you man mm. oh this might be better it. than the other half what do you got 12 year anniversary treehouse that's got to be a 16 treehouse 12 year uh, that's like a four seven five it's missing a little bit of the dank bite that i love in my hazy double mm. ipas but phenomenal beer what do you got yeah so uh i thought the other half beer was going to be the better of the two just judging by the can art i like that simple matte look to a can versus this is a bit more of a holographic look uh and i know that should have no indication of what the taste is but I, for some reason my brain but this oh, is can delicious. Art absolutely makes beer taste better yes this is a four two five easily this is i have another sip oh brian this is just perfect this is we're so shooting as much as your up. lips it's, well, a, it's a little pick me up, Dave. You're just spot on. <laughs> I love it. All right, perfect. I'm gonna pour this beer. By the way, if you're uh, if you're new, if anyone's new watching, we're on live for the first time. We're on oh, my yeah, Twitter. Please go follow Drafts and Drafts. Um, 
and I'll try to I'll try to I don't, actually I can't even post it up. But drafts and drafts, it's it's the name in the top uh, right of the podcast stream. Please go give us a follow. We have a new Twitter account. We've, this is episode 19. We're almost halfway through the year of of live stream posting them up. Um, and yeah, just if you're new here, anything over a four out of five is very good for beers. Right? Yeah. Okay. And so for a four two five and a four seven five, that's a banger start to the show. Also, yeah, totally forgot you went live on your account. For everyone who followed just to see Dave, uh, I'm sorry for being annoying. Second of all, we really appreciate your support. Seriously, we what started as a little side project to get our our one quarterback dynasty league more into fantasy turned to something that we both love doing uh i like to talk i like to hear myself talk i think dave likes to hear himself talk too so it really works out nicely that we just talk at each other and not with each other um but yeah that's a segment we do every episode it's part of the drafts and drafts name is that we do draft draft reviews uh -huh. fantasy drafts fan jeff here okay it. next segment yeah. we're going to move on to is the otq which is our one tough question segment so dave i had this one prepped for you i gave you plenty of time to think about an answer what is your favorite part of playing dynasty what 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 about dynasty makes it worth coming back not just coming back to but sticking around year round versus that redraft uh, mentality of just fantasy in general like is it something related to the the NFL draft being more important to you is it make is it college football season having some value is it the you know the actual regular season games is it trading is so it to me yeah so I'll, I'm gonna cut you off the I mean the highlight out, for me I, listen I know you've had a cold beer so I got to make sure I keep you on track uh the highlight for me in dynasty is the way that I approach watching football now is just so different and I haven't quite hasn't quite bleed it over into the college football side. I'm still not massively watching college football. I think it's also, I have a family now, two young kids. Like I can't spend all day Saturday and Sunday and Thursday and Friday and Monday watching football. So, <laughs> wow, what a me, fucking loser. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's, it's really just that, especially on Sunday and then Thursday night, Monday nights. Um, but on that Sunday, being able to just watch, I, I would do red zone. And so to be able to watch red zone for six hours straight and you can be in and out with kids or whatever, but you can hear from the other room that so-and-so did something. And I know I have them on a team. That's awesome. Or I'm playing against them. That's terrible. Just kind of the excitement in the way I view football. I will say I do love, they still have the Thursday and Monday night games because without them, I would never watch a regular game. And I do appreciate like when I watch a regular game, and I'm going to say other game. I just mean it's the only game that's on that night at that time. Um, or even Sunday night too, I guess, is part of it as well. Uh, I get such more of an affiliation for the actual player's ability versus just like their stat line. Where the red zone just like, bam, 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 stat line here and there. That's just like yeah. what's actually happening in fantasy in general and like who's popping off. But to then when I'm watching the game now, it used to just be like, oh, I'm cheering for a team or it's a good game, bad game. Now I'm watching like, how are their routes? Who's targeting who? What's their mix of pass and run plays? Like, how's the quarterback looking on accuracy? How's their O-line looking? Like, I'm watching way more than just, you know, the casual fan watching a game and looking at the points go up. Um, so for me, it's just, it's just the increased affiliation to how uh, I watch football. And I, I love it. So I, I had to know. What's your favorite of the viewing experiences? Is it like the Thursday night game because it's got something to do? Or is it, you know, your, is it your Monday night football or is it seven hours of commercial free football starts? Oh no, uh, Scott, 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 Scott yeah. makes Scott Hansen's the G he's a homie. I, I would love to hang out with him for an afternoon. Oh my God. I bet you he's an absolute dude. Oh shit. Dave went muted. Uh, all right. So I'm going to assume he agrees with everything I just said. Um, kind of similar to what Dave said, I, in terms of it's changed the way I think about football and specifically about trades, because I've always been a redraft guy. So it's always been, how do I package up a bunch of players and tear up to the best player in the deal? Or how do I take a guy that I don't think is going to be able to sustain what he's doing for the rest of the season and trade him down for two lesser pieces, whatever. It's always been redraft focused trading. And now it's, I personally love the art of making deals and it's perfect for this episode coincidentally because I think there's so much more to making trades than just I have a piece you have a piece let's trade them there is I don't you know and we'll, go, we'll go through the actual science of it but I have extreme satisfaction behind actually piecing together a trade 
that not only makes sense and makes my team better, but also helps the other team truthfully position themselves closer to their goal, whether that is to be more competitive or to be a rebuilder or to to better their chances of winning on their bye week or whatever it is. I I, I have supreme satisfaction in one being able to make those connections between two teams and two the fact that I'd like to think I'm not the most annoying. I'm def- I'm definitely fairly annoying, but I'm I'm I could be way way worse. So it it also brings satisfaction knowing that I think I can can I have a I don't know I feel like I have a sense for how to navigate that boundary between being overbearing and being like a a trade partner that people enjoy trading with or even the trade talks don't turn them off. Um so I think it's definitely a skill that I think can be sharpened and to me that's the fun part about dynasty is that you can't just make a deal to win this season and say fuck it I'll figure it out again next year. Exactly. Like, that's somebody that you have to deal with for I, uh, you know, in the ideal world, the rest of your eternity in the dynasty league. So you can't just <laughs> fuck them over and say, yeah, fuck you, Dave. Like, well, thanks for jumping on my grenade. Like, I'm not going to talk to you again. I don't know. I don't know if that's true, though. I, because I genuinely think, like, I think, I think that the, that's a key point about how you have your dynasty league set up. If your dynasty league is a bunch of novices, or let's say it's like a couple of veterans and a bunch of novices, and you're preying on them, like, hey, bud, you're struggling. I'm looking at your team. You know, Brees Hall's there. He's just kind of like, do you really need him? I I think you could just get a bunch of pieces for him. So here's a big package I'm willing to give you just for Brees Hall. I'm going to give you four guys. We know you love big packages, so don't act like you don't. (laughs) But the point of it is is that that scenario, that person's going to feel really burned. They might not even come back in the league, and you might ruin the league dynamic because you're just taking advantage of somebody. In a league that has, you know, no vetoes, but also a league that has a pretty good standard of trades, you're assuming that that other person is, is accepting of that trade and has done their research, homework, whatever, to be okay with it. So, like, yeah, external view. We, I personally have shit on. I shit on every trade, but oh yeah, that I'm, you're that I'm the not worst. involved in. I shit on every. You're single actually one. the worst. Yeah, no I shit on literally it. every trade except for ones that I'm involved in. And everyone, <laughs> everyone that I'm involved in, I lost, but it was fair. And um, <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's been some that I actually thought were super one sided, and three years later, it's like wow, that was actually one sided the other way. And it's so yeah. there's it's really hard in dynasty. That's what I really appreciate about it the most. It's not like you know you're in the middle of your redraft season. It's week eight, and you trade for CMC because like you know you can use them to win, and you give up some other junk off your bench. It's nothing like that where it's just like it just like breaks that season, um, which I love about dynasty. Yeah, you know, you're so you're so spot on that it's like the the funniest part about evaluating a dynasty trade on the day it happens is that nobody is right, so no one has any leg to stand on. Yes, of course there are market values you can try tie back to to say, yeah, you didn't get enough, or you might have overpaid or whatever. But at the end of the day, time will tell whether that trade was good or not. And sometimes things happen that should not dictate whether it's, I could trade a third round pick for CMC tomorrow. And then CMC could go out and get killed in a car accident. RIP. Not going to happen. But that doesn't mean that I overpaid for CMC. It was a free, you know, like that kind of shit. It doesn't, can't dictate whether a trade was good or not. Um, maybe a, a too extreme of an example. Maybe I should tone it down a little bit. But uh, anyways, let's move on. That was a good OTQ. That was great. Dave, thank you so much for participating. Um, let's move on to the dynasty trade session and most importantly why you suck at making trades in dynasty um so we're going to go through kind of you know the components of a trade starting with you know how to identify trade partners and what what you are need in a trade to by the end of it hopefully identifying some trade strategies you can try to employ that and I'm I'm sure Dave has some things that I don't have listed here that we can add to it but you know, first and foremost, it's pro- it's no secret that if you've been listening or if you're in our league, that Dave and I are the two most active traders in our league. I mean, and if not the two most, we are by f- absolutely two of the three most active traders in our league. Um, shout out PME Warrior. He definitely makes trades because he's actually bored or he's like, is you got a gun to his head and they're like, you have to make a trade today or we're going to kill you. Like, that's what it feels like sometimes when he makes trades. Um, but uh, I, I think I've kind of already expounded upon i think making trades is just as much of an art as it is a science like of course 
oh, you have three good running backs and only one good receiver, and I have three good receivers, only one good running back. The science says, let's trade one wide receiver for one running back and we'll fill each other's holes. Pause. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, <laughs> there's so much more to it than just identifying team needs. There is that art behind how do you actually start a conversation around having a trade or how do you make that initial trade offer or coax somebody else into make, you know, expo- not exposing their trade values. That sounds so manipulative. But there is some some art behind so, that. One piece about that though that I, I've actually now started to think a lot more, and I don't know how you thought about this. You know how we have like the trade analyzer, right? Um, you talk about how like you, you know, talking about keep trade cut. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. fuck, fuck KTC. I gotta be quiet. Uh, but yeah, fuck KTC. That thing is a hot garbage. If you're here, if you're listening, first time, uh, don't use keep trade cut. It's garbage. Um, but no, how we, you you've done your analysis too, and some of the people have put out like, hey, this person's worth three first. This person's oh, worth the trade value chart thing, whatever. There's actually a trade value chart of players. I've thought about a lot now lately. Is like, okay, who has the amount of picks to even pay for those at any one time? And then, are they actually going to rebuild around that player? Is second question. And then. Or are they trying to just have their picks to be able to pick them come draft season and whatever year their stage getting out? And we're three years ahead draft uh, pick, you know, tradable. Um, but I started thinking about it more and more. I'm like, realistically, like you and Brent, who have two, you each have two of the top four wide receivers right now in, in the league. Um, I just don't know, even know, like you couldn't even move them. For the right value, there's, there's nothing. The only person there, that could buy them is Dan, and they're too far out in, in in years. And even still, he probably wouldn't buy them because he's paying so much to only get two assets on a team that needs everybody. <laughs> and so, I, I I see what you're saying, where it says like, say like uh, a trade value chart might say Amon Ross St. Brown is worth three firsts. That's, I think, what the point of labeling someone as valued as three firsts in air quotes is because of the fungibility of firsts. But then if somebody else says, okay, Garrett Wilson is worth two firsts. Yeah. You yeah, theoretically right. should be able to trade Garrett Wilson plus a first for Amon Ross St. Brown. Fair point. Because fair like point. you're not, no one's out there saying, hey, my team is just one Amon Ra away. Let me trade all of my firsts to go get him. And then they trade their three firsts. And now they filled their entire, all the gaps in their team. Like, I see what you're saying. Like, how does no, it make- I get? And I get the point of like why they do it that way. But I do wish it was more. I do. One of the things I do like, well, I don't. I like about Q-trade. There's another site that I've used prior to also help analyze trades. Um, I think it was DTC Dynasty Trade Calculator. Um, you have to pay for it. I paid for it one year to test it out. But they had to do a nice thing where they actually do a. It's just I think it's up to fifty is the value of the of the chip, and so that chip is worth X amount of value. Where keep trade keep trade cut kind of is the same thing, but like on a it's like a four digit. Uh, number they base it off of yeah yeah i think i like that to stage it out and then you can say okay i want a five percent ten percent variance from value back and forth and then you can assess okay is it worth it is it not worth it um but yeah i, I don't i i wish that the trading was kind of broken down more by that than just like i think i think that the first is important but i think the more i've listened to other podcasts and just other analysts talk about it it's almost so bogged down that so few people are actually going to have the amount of first to go buy it. And I would bet to your point, <laughs> you wouldn't even take three first because the three first someone would have is this upcoming. It would be three years in advance, right? It would be all the, right. the, the trending forward three years. And I was like, well, that's not really worth it either. So no. I don't know. It's just it's just a very interesting thing that I've, I've thought about lately as we've gone deeper into it. We've checked in some other people and how they evaluate it. And it's just not to derail, but something I want to talk about. No, definitely. Uh, I, I think you make a really good point that like the trade value charts can only take you so far. You have if you don't have the wherewithal to discern how to navigate a trade given a trade value chart, then you're probably not equipped to play dynasty. It's just like you don't have the mental capacity. Um, but, anyways, let's 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 dive into how to structure a trade. Uh, I broke it up into a step by step guide, so you guys will publish something later. We'll send it out to you via email to all of our most dedicated subscribers. Um, but how to even start to trade. So some people might, it, it may seem like a lot of homework where we may reach out and be like, Hey James, are you still, uh, do you still care about football? Do you want to be in the league anymore? And he's like, Hey dude, totally forgot. I even had a team in the league. Thank you for texting me. Uh, 
but like seriously, you, the first thing you need to do, I think, is look around your league. Figure out, first of all, what is your league parity like? Before you even identify if you're a contender or not, you need to know what does my league even look like? Figure out how many potentially open playoff spots are available. Obviously, keep in mind, nothing's guaranteed. Players get injured. CMC tears his ACL. You know, Joe Burrow breaks his hand. You know, Antonio Brown runs off into the sunset with Aladdin. I don't know what happens. Things happen every year. But keep in mind that at most, most every year in a dynasty league, at the start of your season, there's three teams at most that it should be considered playoff teams. Normally, I would say usually there's probably maybe one or two. Actually, in a redraft league, there might be zero that are guaranteed. But in Dynasty, you might have upwards of three because you tend to have disparity among teams as leagues get older because teams start going through life cycles of contenders versus pretenders versus rebuilders versus reloaders. And we'll get into all that. But look around and say, okay, there's four open playoff spots in my league. I look around and I see that Joe's team is so good, he's going to take up two playoff spots and the rest of the league is wide open. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like figure out like, do, okay, if, if there's four teams that you look around and say, there's no chance I have of beating them, maybe consider taking your team down a different path. But the first thing you need to look at independent of your own team is how many playoff spots are taken or, you know, an, like I said, at the most I'd say is three. I don't, I wouldn't say um, taken. I would just say it's, it's most likely that they are, it's going to be hard for them to miss the playoffs. They would just think so many injuries. Yeah. And that's going to vary league to league too. Like in our league, we have three divisions, which means three division winners are guaranteed playoff spots, which means right. by default, you look at your own division. And if there's two teams that you think are better than you, that's potentially five playoff spots that are gone. Cause two of the other divisions are getting in plus two teams ahead of you. Like, or inversely, you could say there's four teams better than me, but I'm the best team in my division. So I don't give a fuck about being not the best team because once you get to playoffs, all shackles are off. Anything can happen. Right. So, right. I know, also do think, I, I also think that our league. So just so transparently, we've always had divisions. We've never had it where a division winner. Right. Is guaranteed a playoff spot. We just changed that this year. It was voted on. We do an off season uh, ownership meeting, which I encourage if you're in dynasty, you have to have an off season ownership meeting. It's like, even though our league fucking hates it, which is, I don't understand why it's so to me, it's so fun. Cause like you, you're, you're treating it like, oh, I don't have an hour like, out of seven months yeah, to spend with you guys. So sorry. Yeah. Um, but anyways, so if you get a good group of guys that are excited about it, it's, it's a ton of fun and you get really good debates and we have at times, but last, the last one was kind of a dud to be honest. However, this got voted in, it was passed. It's awesome. I do wonder for some of the James and printies of the world, how long it will take them to realize, Oh shit, I probably shouldn't trade good assets inside my own division. Um, and we'll see. Right, that's actually true. We'll see what happens. I th I think it's a really good place of manipulation to your point. If you can win a division every year, it doesn't matter what happens when you make the playoffs. Like, unless to your point, like unless you actually want to like secure that uh, early draft position, fine. Then, that maybe you're willing to give away those assets to ensure you're not winning your division and locking yourself out. But I don't know. Maybe we even need to make a rule that, with that for future seasons saying, Hey, if you win your division, but you're the six, the five or six seed in total, you actually can get into the ping pong balls with, you know, one or two ping pong balls, something like that. Cause like, if you yeah. actually are just forced in there, but everyone's freaking tanking, that's kind of a weird feeling. Yeah. I've seen some leagues that do, the bottom eight teams get ping pong balls instead of the bottom six. Um, yeah. Whereas like, so if you lose the first round of playoffs, since you're not in contention for the money, you actually just get put into the lottery. Also, uh, I think it's, I think if you make playoffs, you had a chance at money. Like you lose yeah. like tough shit. No, I agree. I agree. But anyways, I developed um, the conversation. Let's, let's get into what you want to talk about. specifically. Yeah. On so, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, first of all, like the more, and this is where it came and this, this was an eye opener for me. I started writing that the more open a league seems, the more that I feel like, oh, my team's middle of the pack, but there's no one that's really a top-heavy team, the less inclined I am to make a dramatic seat move preseason because I'm like, I could win with my team the way it is. I don't need to go get Mike Evans to make myself a contender. My league's pretty open. But then at the same time, when there's two or three teams that look like juggernauts, I also feel less inclined to make a big move because I'm like, fuck, if that move's not going to make me a top-three team, I'm not willing to make a move yet. I need to see their team crumble first. I think the moral of the story is, Never make a big move. 
no. But like that was like both my processes <laughs> led me to that same conclusion. And I was like, holy fuck, should I just never be trading? Like what? This is rooting the point of the episode. But I think it gets back to there's a time and a place. Like kind of what we talked about during our rookie draft season, like rookie picks are worth so much. That was the time to buy, to spend rookie picks on players because they were worth so much. When the season starts, that's the time to spend players on youth and rookie picks because everyone wants to win. Like people are scoring points. Um, well, but, I think so, the, well, I think it's just on that real quick. I think oh. that the other piece though, and we mentioned PME warrior earlier about just, you know, it's almost like his wife is guilting him. Hey, if you want to have sex tonight, you better make that trade. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it's like, it gets the juices going, you know, the trade, Oh, you made the trade. Um, but no, I think, I think what he does better than anybody he's willing to lose a trade on paper because he knows that he's already talked to three other people that he can get the piece he actually wants from them. And he just did it with it. And just to, to, to summarize real quick, he did it with Pittman where he got, I think two seconds and a third for yep. Pittman. And he then traded the two seconds for a first. And he was like, Hey, so I got a first and a third for Pittman. I'm actually pretty happy with that. I was like, actually, I probably would have pretty, Pretty happy with that too. But I also would have paid two seconds and a third, but I would have not traded a first for two seconds. So it's just a very weird dynamic of he saw the vision of what he could get for a piece he got now that didn't look like it was worth the right amount to get the right amount that we all agree was like, yeah, it's actually probably pretty fair, fair value. And so right. him and he is a nutshell of like the person of perseverance of I can see the next two trades where mostly run illegal. Like I can't even see this one trade getting through through it. right and yeah. there's so many people that are so so worried about losing a trade that are so risk averse that it prevents them to making from making any trades because they say i'd rather go down with the ship and lose on my own accord than make the trade that everyone makes fun of me for and yeah. i give i will i mean i've said it to brian and matt both set Bo, gilday and bone been like i will make fun of you guys till, till the cows come home that i feel like you both are in this point where you're like well uh I don't feel like dealing with Dave making fun of me in chat anymore. So I'm just not going to make a trade because it's easier for me to lose with my own shit than make a trade that backfires and then get made fun of for that. I need to go. I, I think, it. I think that we just decided. So we just agreed there on that comment that 10 o'clock Eastern or like 11 o'clock Eastern once a week, every week during the season, I am going to roast the teams that lost. And I'm just going to rip them the fucking threads <laughs> so that they feel that same guilt or more guilt than me bashing a trade deal. Like you fucking idiot. Like what a terrible deal that was. And that's our new, that's, that's one of our new episodes yeah. during the middle of the season. Cause I honestly, that's the thing that honestly, our, our league has turned into a little bit of cupcakes. Like it, I'm a little disappointed with some of like the demeanor of some of the people in our league, not being okay. Taking some of the trash. Like the whole point of it is trash talking. And the only one that really seems to give it out is me. Like, you usually come with the top, like, wow, great, super fair trade, everybody. Claps all around. <laughs> and I'm like, I love trades. I love action. This bozo, are you fucking idiot? I would have paid you double for that. Like, why aren't yeah. you dropping that around? How are you only talking to two people? Like, what are you doing? That's just a terrible negotiator. It also kind of opens my eyes to just like how some people actually major in like lit. And it's like, okay, I get it. You you do not understand business at all that you're just willing to talk to one party with your trade deal and be like, yeah, okay, that sounds fair. Let's just do it without checking anything, without comparing to another owner. It's just, just wild to me. So yeah. Um, anyways, new episode, middle of the season. We are going to roast all six teams that lost that week and just obliterate them every week. Yeah, and if you I lose love it. in a row, you're going to get more obliterated. Oh, I love all about getting obliterated. I mean, cheers to that. You're that lit major. Right. You go obliterated. So the <laughs> shut up. Um, so the next one was it kind of goes hand in hand with the looking at the team, the league parody, but it's also looking at your team trajectory, which sounds obvious and sounds self self explanatory, but being realistic with am I a contender? Am I a rebuilder? And if I'm somewhere in between, can I, am I a piece away? Am I several pieces away? Which kind of goes into step three, which is identifying team strengths and weaknesses. But step two of identifying your team trajectory and taking control of it. Uh, Do we have a chart think, of this? Can you post this chart up? Like, what's what are the steps? Uh, I just have it written down on it. That we can, like, I just have it in an outline. 
I wish I had something. Um, I should have built something, but listen, you know, just, I just email it. it to me or send it to me, and I will. I'll build it literally live. I'll build it live. Fuck it, we're doing it live. Fuck it. Um, First live so this, we're doing it live. step step two is t- team trajectory, which was just identify which way you want to take your team in. Um, and or, so our league. Step one. Did, step one was analyze your league parity. Okay. Step two is take uh, look at your team trajectory, and again. Your team can be middle of the pack now. Doesn't mean it needs to be middle of the pack for the start of the season. Uh, well, I think, and I think that there's also a key piece when you're analyzing your team. Like my team is middle of the pack right now. Four weeks in, I could be leading the pack if my players mm-hmm. hit. It's just like it's it's also being realistic. Like what are you, what is your ceiling? What is your floor of your players? And if they come out to the ceiling because there's new QBs, new OCs, new what like p- players left, competition left in the receiver room or in the running back room. That to me is also the piece of like, all right, if you know things are in flux there versus like you think it's going to be kind of a steady Eddie player with the same stat line he has had for the last three years. Um, that is also kind of the piece to that like that's what you're holding on to. But to your point, there is a lot of teams that are stuck in that middle place of like, all right, one guy might be that, but the rest of their team is the same. It's just like you're going to for the same output this season. It shouldn't change that much because not a lot changed. Absolutely. And especially because it takes some projection and it's really easy to say, oh, look, according to some website, I'm the fifth best team. So I'm a playoff team. It takes another extra level of saying, well, if my player, if my, if half my team hits their 90th percentile outcome, I could be an easy top three team. Or if the more realistic case is they all hit their 50 percentile outcome makes me a non playoff team. That's worth analyzing. Like, is my team a shallow glass cannon top heavy team or do i have the depth to sustain an injury stuff like that is worth considering when you're looking at this because it's really easy right now to say well i have two really good receivers two good running backs a good tight end and a quarterback i'm set for playoffs well uh this is the healthiest your team's gonna be for the next six months so keep that in mind that if you don't have that i love that quote you said that so many times in the pod and i I, that has stuck with me so much yeah i'm trying to use it to my advantage um when i'm evaluating stuff right now what i do want to do what i don't want to do um but yeah it's it's uh such a such a banger quote seriously because like there's parts of me that'll say oh i have two good running backs and i have a good running back on my bench right now so i theoretically i should trade that good running back away and get some return for it now because he's not even going to play for me uh until two weeks from now when jameer gibbs tears his acl and it's like i need to put a running back in i'm going to be kicking myself if i trade away a chain so it's like that's going to be that's going to be our next otq yeah, definitely. When you're going to Dynasty. Like, do you want a glass cannon with the absolute best players you can put on your team? Or do like you want to have some depth <laughs> there? Yeah. Do you want to be Brent? Or do you want to actually have some depth there that you can sustain injuries in the middle of the season and not just try to limp into the playoffs and, and win from there? Yeah. So uh, the only the last piece of identifying your team trajectory is, and it's not as applicable to our 1QB league because we do a lottery system, but a lot of leagues have what's known as the least max, poor, least max points for system of determining draft order. Um, And if that's the case, being the first to decide that you're going to tank and you're going to rebuild is a huge advantage, which is why it's important if you play in a league like that to decide now or decide early in the offseason, say, yeah, I have some I have some contending pieces. I got Deontay Johnson at wide receiver. I got Mike Evans. I got Devonta Smith. I got, you know, Joe Mixon and Ken Walker. Like, I feel like I'm competitive. You just reading off James's team. Yep. Uh, but I also have, you know, D- David Carr and or Derek Carr, whatever the fucking guy's name is. Derek Carr and Russell Wilson are my quarterbacks. And I got David and Joku at tight end. And it's like, maybe I don't have a contender, but my team is good enough to score enough points where I might finish seventh, eighth, ninth in the league, which is not good enough to get the one on one. The earlier you identify, fuck, I got to trade away what seems like a good asset like Ken Walker now get my first and a second will be willing to settle on less than his market value because it improves your chances at getting a better draft pick. So in if theoretically you're saying I'll trade Ken Walker and the one Oh five, which is what your pick would be if you never traded him for a first, a second and the one Oh one, because you're now improving to from the one Oh five to the one Oh one. It's a weird way of thinking about when you're removing points from your roster you're improving your draft pick next year. So it's important. Yeah, to think knowing, about that. No, I think that's a great piece of just knowing 
being really up to date on the rules of your league is crucial <clears throat> and knowing yeah. how do you get draft order what's the benefit of trading away picks now versus not how easy is it to acquire picks and like um so so, so important and i think our league it's so funny even this year i still feel like they're <clears throat> figuring shit out and we're near six like i feel I mean, like i'm still learning stuff well, I no, I like know. Is. I'm saying like, but you and I, even like on a basic level, I feel like we're still like, oh my god, like I can't believe that is X, Y, and Z. Um, for example, the Dan, well, the Dan pick, I think we all kind of called out last year is like, you're a fucking idiot. Um, and sure enough, he was. And uh, your your luck happened to pan out where you got the one on one because of ping pong balls and blah blah blah. The rest is history, and now your team's just a juggernaut. But um oh yeah knowing your team knowing your league's rules super important all right perfect let's move on to next step three which is so now you've you've analyzed your league you analyzed your team direction assuming that you want to add players or picks whatever it is step three is identify your team strengths and weaknesses which definitely doesn't it doesn't solely mean oh i'm strong at wide receiver and i'm weak at running back it could mean I am strong at my starting positions. I am. I have strong depth, but maybe not any top heavy uh, explosive players who can give me that, that uh, league winning upside or week winning upside per week. Uh, I'm, I have strength in my, you know, I have youth on my side or maybe I have too many veterans or I have stability. I have a bunch of players who give me a really strong floor, but I don't have any upside players. We kind of already talked about that. Or maybe I have no draft capital. Maybe I do have, maybe I don't have any extra roster spaces. Maybe I have, seven open bench spots that are being unused. There's so many different things besides just saying, oh, I have good running backs, but bad receivers. Of course, that's the obvious one. If you can look at your roster and say, I have five really good receivers and only one good running back, that's an obvious strength and weakness among positions. So you got to start identifying, what do I need now that I've identified what direction I want to take my team in? If it's going to get draft picks and I only have one first next year, my weakness is now draft capital. And I have to do whatever I can to get more draft capital to build out my team for the future. Um, so that's what is there anything that you're thinking of when you're saying, thinking about identifying your team's strengths and weaknesses? I think the uh yeah, I think I think that the piece is to your point, what you just said at the end there really stuck with me of you just need to decide what you actually want to find. Like, what are you trying to improve? So like I just think of my team a lot where I have a lot of good wide receiver depth. I don't have a wide receiver stud. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't have a guaranteed top 12 guy, but potential that's a great example or two top 12 guys. So I have wide receiver depth. That's a strength. But my weakness is I don't have a stud wide receiver that I can count every week to get at least 15 PPR points as like a floor and probably 20 to 25 as is like ceiling. Um, and so, yeah, I think then deciding of, but I also have weakness at running back, right? And so I think it's deciding that point of like, all right, am I? And then it's just a question too: Do I want to contend, or do I have no draft cap? I also have no draft draft capital as a weakness. And so it's to that point of like, you can't do everything. And I think for the first five years, I haven't missed playoffs. So shout out me, <laughs> shout out me, <laughs> hasn't missed playoffs, um, and that was intentional. I'm still gonna not try to miss playoffs. I'm still gonna try to make it. However. I'm starting to see more weaknesses than strengths in the way I've built out my team. <laughs> and there's the opportunity now, like even in this, in this scenario where I still have other strengths, do I leverage those to try to cover some weaknesses or do I kind of let it play out and see how close I can get? Um, and, you know, is it just trying to maximize those, that depth at wide receiver to, to try to trade two for a stud um, <clears throat> or trade two for a running back stud? Like, cause I have a tight end stud. I have, potentially a quarterback stud um i don't know i think i think what you said at the end put it as a as a best picture best scenario for me of just saying okay you have all these players you want to do x y and z um what's the actual thing you're going to go after and that to me is i think the the, the hardest thing to decide um after you decide whether you're going to compete or not compete it's like which one do you actually want to fill the void on yeah, no, you made such a good point, too, because your team's such a good example of if you took Dave's some of his parts and just looked at Tank Dell plus George Pickens plus Terry McLaurin plus Rasheed Rice, whatever, summed up all of his receiver parts, you would say his total, the cumulative value of his wide receiver room is pretty high between points scored or value trade value. But if you actually looked at maybe their projected points for just this season and if everyone stayed healthy across the entire league, his wide receiver room would be weak at the top because 
none of his players are projected to be top 12 or even top 18. And it's just like, how do you identify like, okay, it takes some projection. Do I think Tank Dell could take that leap? Do I think George Pickett could take that leap versus do I want to consolidate and go get whatever I think I'm weak at, which is firepower, or do I like having the depth to withstand injuries? Or do I think what we've already talked about, again, it's layered back to look, analyzing your league. Is my team strong enough just to win my division? In that case, I'll be willing to wait and see. And then maybe week five, if I'm three and two, I'll ride it out. If I'm one and four, maybe I go buy someone. If I'm 0 and five, maybe I just fucking pack it in and say, you know what, this runs over. Um, but that was really well said. I appreciate you highlighting some some points on your own team because I think it went to show that saying wide receiver is a strength is not a strong enough argument because you have a strong total wide receiver room. You have a weak point scoring at the top receiver room, exactly. relatively speaking. So it's Especially like especially for how many people we start. Like I have I yeah. have people that are gonna that are projecting right now double digit PPR points uh every week and they're on my bench. And that feels right. like a miss. You know, I'd rather that maybe I have one of those, but I definitely don't want to have two and three, which I which I right. have two right now. And you have and, nobody projected in that like 17, 18, 19 point per game range. Not that exactly. that's common, but like there's an opportunity there for you to say, okay, I could take what is a strength right now and turn it into more of a neutral point on my team and then build up a weakness, which might be go get one stud. Maybe I overpay. Maybe I give up Tank Dell, George Pickens, and a first just to tear up to like Jalen Waddle. I mean, that's way too much, but you know, you're tearing up maybe only two points per game improves your starting cut, but then you can become really weak and susceptible to injury. So it's, it becomes this real game theory of like, what's the dominant strategy? What's the rest of the league look like? Does adding that high point score make you a difference maker? Or is it worth it just trying to limp in and maybe Pickens rice or Dell turns into a t- an 18 point per game guy. I think that might be the more, the more appropriate strategy. Time will tell. Um, okay. Step four. Now that you've identified what your team trajectory is, where it is relative to the rest of the league and what your strengths and weaknesses are and how you're going to ident- fill those weaknesses. It's time to actually start looking around the league and finding those natural trade partners. You can't just say, I need a receiver. Let me just go fire off tank Dell in a first for every elite receiver in the league. Because like you said earlier, there's going to be teams like Brent's and like mine that are like, oh, why the fuck would I tear off CD lamb for tank? Dell? Even if I'm gaining value, it doesn't make sense for my team. Why would I tear off of it? So you have to actually go find somebody out there who maybe is sitting on one good player. The only good player they might have is AJ Brown or Puka Nakua and say, Hey man, you're not in a position to take advantage of this guy's point scoring right now. I'm willing to give you this young guy plus a first for she rice plus a first for Debo Samuel, whatever it is, just being like, I'm willing to pay up and I know I'm overpaying, but it's giving me that 16 point per game guy. Go find somebody else who's in that we- different team trajectory as you and find where they have excess where you are deficient, if that's possible. It's not always possible. Right, and the biggest challenge on that is did the other person do the same activity to decide they want to do X, Y, and Z? And you... How annoying. Well, it is, but I think you took... You have... uh, I don't want to say manipulated. That sounds really bad, but like you have taken advantage of that in brilliant ways that I didn't think was possible. And so... um, You've shown me some of that path. I mean, whatever your trade last year was with Derek Carr and some other garbage player that you oh, traded. Oh yeah, team. I couldn't believe that, that trade went through. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have you have kind of forced people to capitulate in some ways that I did. I honestly just did not think was going to be possible in our dynasty league. And I think it's opened my eyes to like a lot of these people are fucking stupid. They don't know what they want to <laughs> do with their team. Even if I see the right path, it's like, this is obvious. This makes sense. Like, nah, I don't want that. I want this other stuff over here. It's like, well, that's dumb. But yeah, if you want it, I'll give it to you. That that That's where you keep swooping in. I'm like, here, here's a great trade. Fair, equitable, helps you, helps me in a decent way. And helps you, like, helps nah, me way more. But you're like, yeah, they're like, they're like, no, not have, no, no, just like, within 5 10%, variable range, whatever. And then Joel will just swoop in with like, here's a retarded trade. The part of my <laughs> We were just a beyond stupid trade you probably shouldn't accept, but they're like, you know what? That sounds pretty juicy. I'm it. <laughs> and then they just slam accept. I don't know how you do it. You, it's like it'd be one thing you did it once or twice. It's probably happened eight different times in the six years that we've been going that you're you've now done it. And at this point, I'm just like, I need to make more just stupid trade offers and just see who wants to accept things. It's crazy. 
I mean, part of that too is about talking to a manager and getting to know like, Hey, like, what are you trying to do? Like, how, because like you just said, if you don't, if they haven't analyzed their team or the league or the league trajectory or how, where they're going, it's hard to just throw it. You can't just fire off Dalvin cook to a rebuilder for their first and go, Hey, Dalvin cook, he's coming off on a running back 11 season for your first. seems like it makes a good trade. And then boom, sitting there going, why the fuck would I want a 20 year old running back who is unsigned in free agency? Hey, I'll give you DeAndre Hopkins for a first. Like he's he put up a top 18 season. Like, dude, I'm coming off of a the, the tenth place finish. I don't want down DeAndre Hopkins if he was the number one overall receiver. Like it makes that's not identifying a good trade partner. So it's like it's worth it to talk. Just make conversation. Hey, dude, I saw I saw that you're you're four and two right now. Are you trying? Are you making a playoff push? Like, because I see some. I see an op, an obvious trade opportunity for us right now. I see an opportunity for me. I have too many receivers right now. Like you said that are scoring enough to be starters and I can't start them all. Can I trade? Is there anybody on my team that you see that you like, or if not, no big deal. Like no problem. I'm, I'm just trying. I haven't, I get a trade itch. I text people probably once a week to make trades. Uh, I think I have three outstanding trade uh, texts to Nick Printy going, Hey, uh, do you want to make a trade? No, no, nothing. And literally no other back conversation. Just do you want to make a trade? No answer. So I'm going to say that's a maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I, so there is, um, one of the things I don't know, we should, we, I don't think we've talked about this on the pod before. Maybe we have, where do you land on the auto accepted traits? I've done it before actually. So what I do, what I did in, I have, I have a league with, I don't know if I've met, I think I mentioned, it. I have a league, two leagues with home, my friends. And I have one league with, actually I have two leagues with strangers. Um, but in one league with strangers, I, was rebuilding and I just renamed you can nickname your players in sleeper and I nicknamed them their trade value. And I said, I will accept the first person who sends a trade offer with this. And I nicknamed like James Connor, any second, you know, uh, Tyler Higby, any third, whatever it was. I can't remember who it was. It was just like, and not a lot of people make offers, but then as soon as someone makes an offer and you accept the floodgates kind of open, people go, Oh, he was serious. He's just going to accept the trade as soon as he gets one. So then you can put somebody else in the block. That's like, hey, I'll put, I'll, I'll take, you know, Evan Ingram, two seconds gone. Somebody who's contending might go, fuck. If I don't make this trade, somebody else is going to do it. And so then they might make that again. I'm, I haven't done it enough to know for sure, but I had a lot of success like last year in the off season. I traded away like J- the example was James Conner for a second and a third. And I traded away Julio McLaughlin for two thirds. Like I just made these deals where I was like, I don't want any points on my team. I'm going for the one on one. I want to trade away as many points as possible as soon as possible because it's the least max points for style. I think it's a really unique thing. I heard about it on a podcast. I thought it was a little corny at first, but after trying it, I thought it was pretty cool. What do you think? Do you think it would, it would ever work in our league or do you think it's our league's too close knit for that to work? I think our league is the perfect system for it to work where we are enough close knit. It's like if you're and it can be long. If you're not going to check your app in 10 days, I'll give you a whole fucking week. Go on vacation. You still got three days of time at some point to check your damn app. If you can't check an app to at least decline or whatever it is, I, it's it's hard for me to not think that that would actually be a great way. To- oh, you mean the auto trade automatically goes through if it's if it's not rejected or accepted? Correct. I think that's really cool. I think it could ruin leagues, but I do think it's really cool being like, if you can't be bothered to respond, it automatically goes through. Exactly. That's fucking cool as shit. Yeah. Like I, I have a trade out to Nick Printy that's been out for at least a month. And I just kicked him out of the league. He's not gonna see this. Fuck. Yeah, I might have to. I honestly I, I love you, Nick. I texted him two weeks ago when I was with you in Arkansas. I was like, hey, want to make a trade? No answer. A week later, I gave him the finger emoji pointing back to the text. No answer. And it's just like, dude, I get it. If you're not if oh, you're too busy for fantasy football, you're too busy for my passion. Congratulations. I don't need you in the league. Sorry, he Nick. is busy. He is busy. Oh, he's busy. Bad. Is he the only one who's busy in the entire world? He's busier than you, but I no, he's uh, not more busier than me. And I do understand. I do. I do wish he was more active of a participant. But anyways, I will say the the point I was making, though, is like, I think that that rule is amazing. And I would love to implement it. It has to be long enough. Um, But yeah, I think if it's just a way to almost force some of those people in or or the option is like, hey, if it hits that point and that trade does go through, the trade goes through, you're kicked out. 
Yeah, I. It could be like I, week four. Week four, trade goes through. You're kicked out. Dude, and I we just welcome in a new manager immediately. And so you, so one person fleeces one deal, okay, and that manager's gone. I wouldn't even, if you're going to kick him out, I wouldn't let the trade go through. But uh, sure, sure, sure. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. But like, that could be the signal to kick him out. But like, I've, I've like, already yeah. messaged managers in my league, been like, hey, man, listen, like, I know you're busy and all, but if you can't be bothered to check the app, I'll find somebody else to take over your team. Like, oh, no, dude, I'm so sorry. Like, I really, like, honestly, I, I'm so excited. Like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, okay, just like, Again, it's not personal. We can still be best friends, but so you're bringing me I'm in. Kicking. You're bringing me in. Yeah, you're like like fourth or fifth in the list. Like, so if I just got four from what I was second <laughs> a year ago, how am I now fourth or fifth? Dude, you moved down, bro. You moved down in the books. Gave you too much shit for my trades, so I moved you down. I'm too sensitive. I thought I get at least some grace to do all these podcasts with you. Damn. Um, but yeah, so back to the whole figure out your what you're identifying your natural trade partners. I don't, I can't still, I'm still so shocked that I see these co- incredibly under researched trade offers where it's like, I'll give you Nick Chubb for Rashad White in a first. And I'm like, Nick Chubb's 29 years old. Rashad White's 23. And they're both putting up the same points per game. Why would I ever make that? Because Nick Chubb has name value, like I'm not, that's a made up trade. I'm not throwing T bone. Like that's the type of trade that I see sometimes, and I'm like, where did you get the idea that I wouldn't even give a first for Nick Chubb straight up, fully healthy when he's 28? Maybe I would mid season, but like, I don't. Sometimes I get trades, and it's like it makes me scratch my head how that could possibly be an offer. But you have to bite your tongue when you get a trade like that because it's part of the art of trading. Is you can't be an asshole when you get a trade you don't like. Um, well, I think, I think that's the other. I think that that is an option that I wish people actually did. Like, if you just don't want, just decline it. Yeah. Because then what happens when you decline me? I'm gonna text you after and say, "Oh, hey, like, were we even close?" Like, I wish you would say, "Hey, super close. Would love to add the X, Y, and Z." Unfortunately, again, seeing that some people in our league are just not business savvy at all. They're not keen on negotiating. They're just kind of like either let it go or let's reject it. And then you come back and you're like, it's, it's either like, like no, 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 you weren't even close. All right, fine. And I understand what I understand that the straight up reject. Then other people are like, yeah, you were super close. It's like, well, if I was super close, why not counter it? It's just right. like, it's super, it's, it's just a button. It's a button and you add whatever you want from my team and you get it potentially. Right. Or uh, just say you don't want to trade. So I don't wonder if yeah. I, there's, hey, hey, listen, man, like I don't want to trade. You know, T. Higgins. Like I just don't like. Would it no matter what you? I know that I'm going to value him more than what you're willing to pay, so I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. I actually appreciate that, but just for shits, what could I give you? <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. Um, but yeah, so like, that actually gets into like considering when you finally identify that trade manager that fits the criteria of, you know, satisfying your weaknesses for their strengths or vice versa. Consider how they tend to value your players and picks. Um. That obviously isn't going to be for the portfolio player because it's really hard to get to know 12 managers times 30 leagues, 360 different managers. It's hard to understand that. But if you're playing in a couple home leagues, it's really easy to figure out which managers love picks, which managers tend to love running backs, which managers have an affinity for Jets players and love to, you know, they're masochists and like to hurt themselves. Like, you know, those are the types of guys you can identify and say, I'll give you Mike Williams for a second. Um, But like, you know, uh, it, it also gets back to when you're thinking about a player's roster and how they value players. I remember a while back we had a trade go through and you were like, I can't believe you traded away your running back four and your wide receiver four for that guy's wide receiver one. And I personally think that's a bullshit way of an, analyzing a trade because just because that a guy is my wide receiver four doesn't mean it's not somebody else's wide receiver two or somebody else's wide receiver one or a good player. It's just like, it's a, a sneaky subtle way of devaluing the guys and to me i think that's a logical fallacy you can't assign player values based on my roster but maybe i'm alone in that thought and like why does somebody else's roster to you dictate a player value because i disagree with when i see a guy if he's worth a first he's with the first whether he's your wide receiver your tight end three or tight end one but what do you think like do you think that's an exploitable thing or is that no the well the yeah, I, I think that the point of it was saying there's two things. One is the competition piece. Okay. So if I know I'm giving you my wide receiver one, so I'm giving you my best asset, the best asset of the deal, and 
Uh, you're giving me two players that probably aren't going to be starters on your team next year. And you're only giving me two, right? So if you're giving me three or four, okay, there's a different conversation to have, but just two. I'm replacing one of those non-starters as a starter immediately. And then the other person wasn't going to start anyways. You're only net losing one asset. It's really hard for me to understand the logic behind that as a one competitor. I'm already making a team that is better with pieces they weren't going to start now starting on my team is going to be mentally and realistically, my team probably can't compete with them if everyone's healthy. If you assume natural projections, my team is not competitive with them. Right. One. Maybe they're trying to be competitive. Maybe they're trying, or they are, but they're thinking they can still be competitive while getting more assets, satisfying another. They said, hey, I have no depth. Hey, I have no draft picks. Hey, I have no uh, use. Well, maybe. Uh, either way, the, the trade was a net lo loss because they 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 were only going to be making your starting team better and their starting team uh, potentially have slightly higher points if they were actually going to start the fourth running back on your team as their running back two or whatever flex. Um, their, their projected mm -hmm. points would be a little bit higher, but to think that that was going to make them more competitive with you on face value was just unrealistic. Two, That's interesting to me because... Well, so, on. so the second piece I'm going to add there too, though, is like they also could have potentially shopped to get more value out of it to other players, to other teams. They chose not to do that for whatever reason. Um, and so that's the other piece of like your team is already projected right now to be one of the top, say, three teams. If I'm trying to beat your team, I'm probably not adding assets to your team without subtracting startable players on your team today that I think we are misaligned on their rankings. And that's the key piece, right? <clears throat> And if they really think that they're misaligned, like, yo, Nico and Rashad should be starters. And I like how you knew exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> and, and and you and you disagree with that, fine. But but the, if, it's hard to give up that wide receiver one who is really a top four wide receiver in the league, you know, to any person you talk to. Um, it's hard to give that up at that asset without guaranteeing they're stealing value from your team in a startable position. That to me was the biggest surprise. I don't mind the trade of like, okay, getting another wide receiver really good for another really good running back for an absolute stud alpha top six pick in every redraft and every dynasty league. But I would obviously want to make sure that to help me become more competitive against you, I need you to subtract from your starting lineup that I also believe is, is great um, for, for whatever that value is. And if it was like, you know, in a Devonta Adams, I know you didn't have, but like, okay, Devontae might score more than Nico next year, might be your starter, but I'm not going to value Devontae more than Nico at today's dynasty pricing. Nico would be higher. So, okay, you, you have some argument sake there for the longevity and everything else, blah, blah, blah. But I know your team, and I know there's other pieces there too that I would have probably have tried to make other moves against to bring them over instead of the pieces that were taken. And it still probably would have been on paper a fair trade. Well, so okay, so there's two things going through my head. I hope I don't, hope I don't forget them both. Um, the one thing is, as you're talking, it led me to back to another point, was what if the manager in question identified as he has a strong lineup, so the weakness he's identifying is the fact that he has no depth to withstand any injuries whatsoever. With pre-trade, his best bench player was Adam Thielen. So like adding Nico and Rashad and Brock Bowers for Jamar Chase gave him three players for one which yes of course it made my starting lineup better but it did weaken my depth undoubtedly unequivocally i got weaker from a sheer total point scored a uh, total value standpoint but i did gain a top heavy asset kind of like what you were talking about we talked about earlier with your wide receiver room being very good from a volume standpoint but maybe not in a single uh high scoring week standpoint um but the other thing was I find it fascinating because I don't do this. I could not care any less what the other person's roster would look like after a trade, unless I'm trading for a draft pick. So the only, the only reason, and I will say this, the only reason I would value it that way is because you were already pre-trade projected to be a top three team and you ended yeah. up winning the league last year. So knowing that, that to me is the core face of like, all right, I don't want to make your team better because you already right. were the winner. With it when it when you when you struggle through the season and your team hit towards the end of the season, not a good sign going into a fresh season of dynasty. 
So that's the only time I'm evaluating it transparently. Like if I'm trading with, you know, I just did a big trade with Trevor. I didn't look at his team as like, okay, what's your team? And I'd be like, I'm making my team better and I'm happy with the trade. The only instance I'm doing this would have been with you, Brent, potentially also Gil Day too, as you were the top three teams projected outside of me for the last two seasons or so. Um, and especially last season, I'm I'm just looking at those pieces and saying, okay, I don't really want to make your team better. If I am heavily confident that I'm winning the deal, fine. I, then if I, and again, I'm a pretty heavy negotiator, as you know, in trade talks. But outside of that, I, I'm probably not trying to inherently trade with you because I, you think the same thing. You think you're making your team better by whatever trade you're doing. And that's also in the psychology of me, like, I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't equate. Right. So I have to be so confident that I'm winning that deal to want to make that deal. Um, that it'd be worth it. You know, dude, I think it's so cool because I truthfully never think mic. about this. Oh, sorry. I said, I, sorry. I think this is so cool because truthfully, I never think about this when I'm making a trade. I never look at unless that's uh, because I'm getting there first or they, I already own there first or whatever. Then I will consider, am I making their team better and they could get a better pick? Other than that, like it's never even crossed my mind that like, oh man, this trade could make this team better. Which like, if you came to me in week six, I and I, you were like, hey, can I get Calvin Ridley for? Uh, I'll give you a, a first for Calvin Ridley in a second. Boom, he's gone. I don't care because I'm getting more value than I think I can get from him at any other time. Unless again, like I said, unless it's making my team uncompetitive and I'm a competitive team. You come for one of my starters and I don't have anyone on my bench, then I'll think about my team. But if it's like wow, I just made Dave's team from a bubble team to a playoff team. Like, I really don't give a shit because I think playoffs is mostly a crapshoot and I'm not too worried about me giving you the one piece that's going to put you over the edge. And it's just, I think, it, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think it's cool that you look at it that way because when you started saying that, I was like, Dave, you sound like an idiot. But I'm like, maybe you don't. Maybe I'm the idiot for never thinking about that ever. Like, I remember I traded Brent. I traded Brent somebody a couple years ago where I was like, man, did I just give Brent like a starter against me? And I was like, I'm just not going to think about it and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, but like, I, it, that never crosses my mind. If I'm getting the value I think I should get or above above value I should get, gone. I don't even need yeah, to think I about think, your team. Well, I think that the other tough thing is, again, personal value on things. Had those That's other a great pieces, segue. That's my next well, piece. Okay, so because the, the other piece about that trade that happened that I was most, I won't say frustrated about, but I'll call it frustrated or like questioning on, my value that I would stake into future value for Nico and Rashad White was not very high. <laughs> right. And so Where it's like you were shocked to learn that like Nico and Rashad are probably worth two firsts each and one right. could be. And you're like, no right. way. And I'm like, mm, the ADP says so, they are. Or had they been, had it been like a James Cook or um uh, right. and Rashad goes ahead of James Cook, which I think is baffling for you. Right, right, right. Or like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like Pacheco or something like that. So say you get a young stud on a really good team that you think has more upside, still could flail out, but has really good upside projecting them and for the wide receiver to be, I don't even know. I don't have a great example. It's kind of in that Garrett Wilson tier. Someone, yeah. someone, but maybe right. like a Dan Waddle, Devonte Smith, Chris Olave. Yeah, I would have felt so much more confident. I, maybe this is again just too much bias, but like I would have felt so much more confident. Like, okay, fair trade. It's real. You're allowed to but be the biased. Nico thing. Was like <laughs> there was so much competition with Tank. It was a brand new quarterback with a rookie wide receiver alongside him who basically matched slash outperformed him at certain times. Right. And he didn't have a contract at the time. Yeah, and then Rashad White had all these challenges too where like he was just really bad at processing, but he got a ton of points just from catching the ball. First year with Baker, their OC's gone now. Like there's just a lot of things there that you're just looking at. Like if you actually got into the weeds of it, it was like, whoa, that to me, to me, the, the toughest thing, I think you got rid of your two most questionable assets of what their actual potential is going to be, ceiling floor. You got rid of the two most questionable ones to get one of the more sure things in the in the world than Jamar Chase or potential sure things. I will and say, so, now you're penalizing me for the strength of the rest of my roster. Nico and Rashad being my most questionable assets is just a credit to the fact that I have CD Lamb and... Right, 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 right. And, and my Jamar point is, I'm and, not giving up Jamar for anything of question. Right. I'm, I'm giving it up for massive potential upside with a young person who is just like... 
exploded recently. You know, like I would even say if you want to put in Kyron in there, like Nico Kyron exploded part of that discussion too, where it's like his. No, you're not wrong. Like I'm just so anyway. wanted to hear about your thought process on it. I yeah, thought it was yeah, interesting yeah. the way that we thought to about me, it. Was just, to me, it was the most bizarre trade that I've ever seen because also it was between two powerhouses, uh, two of the three or four powerhouses of the league to make. And that it kicked trade. off our. It was the first trade of our league. We opened the league and the basically the biggest trade. I think probably the two most valuable or not the, the most cumulative value trade ever in our league probably ever uh anyways so while we're still on the subject which was identifying your natural trade partners and how we got on that most recent subject was identify how, the way your opponent values players and picks because that's important if you can't always do that but if you can identify tendencies or things that they lean on as far as the way they value players you, not to exploit it, but to keep that in the back of your mind as you're making trade offers, if they love picks to throwing a pick in or enticing them with a pick can kick a trade over the edge. Vice versa. If they love young players, if they love veterans or love receivers, whatever um, next is really consider the way you value your own players and picks like know that you can be exploited. I know I love picks. I know if someone comes to me with a pick, I know that you know that I love picks. So like, how can I use that? Like, oh, I'll give you this player for your first. Like knowing that you know that, can I make you feel like you're pulling the wool over my eyes when in reality I'm, I don't know. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight that it's like, it's totally okay and actually encouraged to have your own set of values and be higher or lower on a player. And that's what makes Dynasty fun is being able to be above or below market on players, identify those differences in market value, capitalizing those. For example, I could be higher on Jonathan Brooks right now in preseason. And if you came to me and said, hey, Joe, uh, I, I'm interested in Jonathan Brooks, and I say, I'm not trading him for less than a top eight running back price, you have no right to complain to me and say, well, that's not market value. I'm, that's bullshit. Like, why, Well, fuck you, dude. That's my value. You asked me. So you can't you have no right to criticize the way I think about a player. I do think inversely, it's not OK for me to come to you with an arbitrarily high value on a player and say, hey, I'm interested in Christian McCaffrey. Um, and actually, I think Jonathan Brooks is worth more than Christian McCaffrey. How about I give you Jonathan Brooks for Christian McCaffrey? And you're like, what the fuck is this? Like, don't it's OK to be high. Hold your own player values closely held, highly regarded and keep them for if someone comes after your own players. I don't think it's okay for me to go to you with a trade, hold my values where they are and say, take my value for what it's worth for your guy. And you're like, I didn't even want to trade. Well, my. I think it's okay. If as long as you don't get offended, I think it's, I think it's fine actually. <laughs> but me uh, proposing it to you feels like the scummy. But part yeah, I do. I do. I trend to when I make trades and dynasty, I usually go to the person first and say, Hey, Looking at your team, there's some pieces I'm interested in. Is there anyone that's just absolutely untradeable? No matter if I could give you my entire team, and you still wouldn't accept an offer, kind of thing. And that usually kind of smooths the initial. Um, all right, like let me look at my team, and then they evaluate. They're like, "Hey, this piece I would really have a hard time moving." Okay, then I need to know. I would know your value on them as one of the most valuable pieces in fantasy, kind of thing. Um, and that is usually a good spark point. And then if they start to say, hey, like these are the ones I'm more interested in moving. All right, well, what about this piece or this piece? And then they'll usually kind of draw it from them. Well, yeah, maybe, but like it has to be a pretty enticing offer. I need at least X, Y, and Z. And, and they'll look at your roster too. And usually you can get someone kind of thinking and crafting what that trade looks like from their side because it is a lot easier to negotiate. This is just maybe personal overshare on the negotiation side it's a lot easier to counter negotiate an initial offer than write your initial offer trying to have them come back at you especially if the other people are not very big traders if they're big traders it's easy to send really whatever because they'll know how to counter it's like that's a crazy offer versus like oh that's actually not too much or whatever it is but if it's someone who doesn't trade very much in your league getting them to kind of draft up that initial offer and that's how i made my trade for cmc and Devonte adams and everyone for laporta and picks was just kind of being like all right like i want laporta i'm willing to make a move for him with a lot of the pieces i have i just need to understand what materially do you want so we can come to a rough nearly you know equal trade on it um 
And so that's just my advice. If you are going to try to like approach the people who are kind of unapproachable or not making a ton of trades is get them to start crafting that initial trade. So you can kind of come back with like, all right, like not out of the word, you know, not unrealistic, not crazy. Here's how we can counter. And here's where I'm at and see if you can make a deal. Dude, that's such a good point around getting somebody else to craft the trade because not everyone. I said, there's a good point around getting everybody to craft an initial trade because not everyone's going to have, Never mind the same values as you, but even a reasonable value. And I think this goes to why. And don't laugh. I think this is why trade calculators can be useful tools. Not necessarily. I am adamant about I could not care less whether a trade calculator says I'm winning or losing a trade. In fact, you could probably go plug in that Jim Chase trade and it's probably going to say that I lost the trade and I do not give a fuck because I feel like it made my team better. But trade calculators are useful because it's going to give you a loose idea of what the market thinks of a player. And it will help you ground yourself on player values, especially if you're not as active in a dynasty space aside from your own league, because your league economy might be nothing like what the rest of the world thinks. That doesn't mean the rest of the world is right. It just means you have to have an idea relative to other players where they're what their value is. Cause I'll never forget a couple of years ago. It was like the turtles came to me and asked if I wanted Deandre Hopkins for Calvin Ridley and my first. And I had to gently be like, Hey man, I don't know if you're aware, but right now Calvin Ridley himself <laughs> is worth more than Deandre Hopkins. So I don't know why I'm the one adding the first here and then being like, what the fuck? Why the fuck would we ever do that? I'm like, Listen, man, don't get mad at me because I'm pointing out an observation that I'm noticing. Now, I could like Hopkins more than Ridley. That's totally fair. But to come to me and ask me to add a first to a player that's generally regarded as more valuable was a weird opening offer that was a cold offer, too. So where? what do you think? Have You, you said you mentioned some trade calculator that you use, which I was surprised to hear. I know you always say you hate keep trade cut, which I also do hate keep so trade cut. That, yeah, so that so the the site I used it was from a podcast. The guy hopped on and he kind of just talked through how they got their evaluation, and so it wasn't a bias of like if you if you've never used keep trade cut, when you first go in there, you don't even log in. The first thing it asks you is like it gives you three players. They're usually the same position, but they can be be like studs too to evaluate where you wouldn't draft evaluate mm. them. And it just to make a decision. It's like marry, fuck, kill, and <laughs> you have to decide: are you going to keep them, trade them, or cut? Dave's been fucking Brock Purdy every day. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, 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 maybe Laporte actually. I mean, he is um, pretty. So <laughs> yeah, and so you have to make the decision. But like, so ultimately, it's just it's it's just a very weird thing, and anyone can go in and spam that to their dismay as to whatever this. And again, there's a lot of novice people that are also going in there and just kind of. <clears throat> You know use keep trade cut not have the settings right change something whatever for super flex not super flex for redraft not redraft for dynasty not like it, it's just it's just a very ambiguous site in my opinion the site i used it wasn't very expensive and i used a promo code too but it was um i think it was just called dynasty trade calculator uh i can look it up just to make sure it was that was the one i didn't renew it um I was just curious about you know the the idea of having a third party like pulse check i think is well, so the challenge was, um, it is dynasty trade tra dynasty trade calculator.com. So shout out to them. I forget who the guy's name was, but basically what they do is they, they pull in basically through the open APIs, all of the different trades that are happening in only dynasty leagues. Mm -hmm. So they use real trade calculation to prove, to show, Hey, okay. And so you can go in there with things like, Oh, hey, I, I like that. I want to real trade trades that have happened. I want to trade Devonta Adams. Okay. Well, here's the last 20 trades we've seen with Devonta Adams included. Here's what people are actually getting for him. And then they use that along with their professional team analysts to share. Okay. Hey, here's our analyst summary of how much this person's worth based on age performance team everything else is part of it almost like normal traditional dynasty rankings and they marry those and that's how they get their calculation value of what things are worth to me it, and sometimes it was almost within 10 percent of keep trade cut it's like okay great other times it was like a 50 percent variance and so to me it was a really big eye-opener to me to just say okay one the discrepancy is huge <laughs> 
which is kind of what I thought and, you know, kind of felt in my gut of when I was making some of these trade offers or hearing some others, like that just makes no sense. Um, but it, it was a really nice way to kind of also just be like, okay, I'm not crazy. And some of the KTC stuff is just Garbo. And that's where for me, I've just kind of disregarded KTC almost entirely. Um, I don't really have a trade calculator now. It's just kind of, I think through the five years of playing so far in dynasty and just seeing and being a part of a lot of trades, I have a pretty good feel of what things are going to be worth to your point. It's like once you, once, once the arc hits of just simply going by age, skill set, draft position, you know, performance and lever and team and OCs, coaches, whatever to get your base value of whatever they're going to be worth, like on, on a paper scale. And then you layer in, how do you feel about them? You know, so you can, you can move them up and down. Like I, I, I hate uh, JSN. So JSN is a hundred. Um, but, and I hate Trey Burke, Trey Burks. He's, he's a, he's 101. Um, but you know, I love X, Y, and Z being able to adjust your own rankings on that is, is kind of the final step in there. And once you have all that, like it's, it's pretty hard to make a, terrible trade offer you know like once once you're pretty pragmatic with it it's really hard to make a terrible trade offer you can make like oh that's a little bit heavy-handed you know and stuff like that but it's it's really that value piece that once you understand how age performance position skill set team um you know route trees or whatever and, and you know where they're actually going to be lined up and other competition against them on the team all those factors together then you can actually then say, okay, you line all those up based on whatever you think. And then you can kind of then say, okay, do I like a certain person more than another? Like for me, if you look at the Garrett Wilson, Drake London, George Pickens, um, Chris Olave, third year wide receiver tier, like you can break those out however you want. I'm going to have my own ranking. You're going to have your own ranking, but it's not going to be set, you know, generations apart, but it's going to be however you rank those, you might just not be willing to put up you know, two first or something or whatever it is. And so for me, those are the pieces that I think is like how you get to the end goal. And if you can extract value from that, that's where you're going to be able to win leagues or sell high because everyone else is like loving this player that you're like, ah, like if I really look at it, they're not that great. Haven't been that great. I'll sell the hype versus the actual performance. And then you capitalize on that too. No, that really well said, especially around the idea of, learning how to once you have an idea for your own set of values it's really hard to craft an insulting trade like of course i'm not always going to give you my best literally the most fair trade for you first i'm going to get gauge your value on my initial trade offer but that gets us to our next step step five which i labeled as the soft skills so now that you've identified the league parity your league trajectory your holes and weaknesses and another team that satisfies the the weaknesses you're trying to make strengths how do you start the trade this is the, where the soft skills of trading come in we've already done all the technical analysis the, the first four steps were do your technical analysis the next step is what do you do when you go to send that first offer do you dave like what do you like to raw dog a trade offer or do you like to communicate like do uh, you just cold call it i'm uh i'm i i like both uh to be to be frank um, but realistically, w when I try to approach trades, it just depends on what the piece is. And so, uh, if it's like an unknown, I I'm fine to raw dog it. Like I, like I sent an offer to for Zamir White to Printy. Um, you know, someone that's probably not. I, I guarantee Zamir White's not starting from this season. Maybe in a flex, but probably not until he proves it. Uh, Back to his team. Printy probably doesn't know team. who he is. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I'll just throw an offer where he sees a second for Zamir White. He's like, hmm, feels pretty good. Um, and hopefully he accepts. He hasn't. It's been a month. So it's, I'm probably going to draw at this point because, like, fuck him. Um, but for a high valued asset, uh, and so I said for a high valued asset too, unless you know you're coming over the top, it's much, much better, in my opinion, to go have a conversation with them because most people, their top, three players are essentially what they would call, I, I I call the core of their team. And you usually don't want to move the core of your team because it's the fucking core of your team. And you're trying to assess your next moves around that core. Um, so you really need to spark that conversation of like, all right, like where do you really land on this person? 
they're getting older, they're young, they're whatever, new, new, whatever. You try to talk them through the reasons why there might be some question marks there, but also why you're willing to put a gamble on them and spark that conversation. Um, and so I'm a big one of that. The other, the third thing I also love to do is when you do have that slightly lower ranked person, I like to then do a conversation starter. So again, same thing as if it's for a higher end piece, knowing I really want the lower end piece. So it's the same scenario of Princey uh, on Barkley. Yeah. Hey man, looking at your team, I'm letting like, running back. What's it going to take me to move Saquon? And he's going to throw out Rasheed Rice plus. Okay. Well, okay. What about some other pieces you have? You know, I just need a running back. That's a little steep for Saquon, but like, let's keep that in the back of our pocket. You know, what I love, else I, I love this. And then I, I go, it. and he goes, Oh, what was Zimmer White? And I do Zimmer White for a second. Okay, great. <laughs> Done. And so I did that actually. The, the only trade that I've actually done that successfully a while ago was with Dan, where he threw in Purdy. I knew I wanted Purdy. Purdy was not the main achievement of the trade. I just knew no matter what, I wanted Purdy in that trade one way or another. And he, at the end, just threw him in. And I was like, great. I didn't, I didn't ask for him because of the way I, I, I structured the conversation to what I was getting to and how I wanted to add a piece. He threw out like four names. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll just throw him Purdy. <laughs> and, he, and he did. Um, and Purdy was like QB6 last season. And so that's kind of the things that I think if you're if you're if you're gonna talk high end, I feel like you have to go with the conversation. If you're gonna go low end, you, you can either shoot the raw dog, or you can do the, <laughs> you can do the high end lead in, knowing you're willing to negotiate down for the lesser valued asset. I think it, I still I love the way that we think about this so differently because I love your approach to that, and I do love the idea of the bait and switch. Um, I I actually haven't successfully done that. And I keep reminding myself when I do want a lesser asset like a Keaton Mitchell or a Jaleel McLaughlin to not just outright go target them because then the other person's going to go, what's up? Joe wants fucking Jaleel McLaughlin? Like, nope, not trading him to Joe because Joe must know something that I don't. And I don't have the time to figure it out. So I'm just going to say no. Well, I will say, though, the one <clears throat> actually the raw dog that works really well is the other way. Brian offered me Mike Wilson last year for, I think, a third. Uh, I think it was a third. And... Maybe it was a second. It was a second and a third. I forget what it was. But he just like straight up offered me a player. All I had to do was give him one pick. It was like the most instant smash. I don't think I've ever hit a trade faster. Um, I don't know why. I just did. And sure enough, I did. I thought the value was right. And literally then the next hour or two is people coming to me like, holy shit, you did it for that value. I'll give you a second. I'll give you two thirds. I'll give you this and that. Like everyone fucking wanted them. Dude, and we so made a trade later that night. Media. I did. I did. I, did tra- I then traded him for a second to, I think, Dan, a second and a third, Dan. And then I traded the second for, not Tank Dell. I traded a second for someone else pretty good. I forget who it was. Either way, it doesn't really matter. But the point Jake was, like, when, when you do the opposite way, if you're the person giving up the player for something that is just like, I don't know, an unknown, a, a draft pick, it's so... It's so fugazi to me. Like it's like it's there. You know, it's eventually going to be worth something, but like you really don't fucking know until you get to that year and that draft class. And even then, it's kind of a crapshoot until you get to your pick or that round. So, I think that is a great way to raw dog. Is if you're going to send out the player first, if you're offering the player up just to get a draft pick back, I think that's probably the easiest raw dog because then they know. Okay, do I want that player for that value? <clears throat> really instant yes or no it's not like i'm changing my draft lineup today i'm not changing the value of my team today to go compete unless i think that player is going to help me um in a good way like it's just such to me that's probably the best raw dog you can do see and i so this is why i think this is such a different mentality to this and i think it's good that we have such different mentalities i think the idea of raw dogging versus communicating versus negotiating versus texting first or providing a text along with the trade comes back to the manager, not the players. I think there are certain managers in our league that don't want to be bothered with trade negotiations. There are some managers in our league who don't even know they have a trade outstanding. So I do send them a text also. And then there are other managers who would actually rather just have a full on trade conversation will land on a trade. And then we'll just send it in the app and accept. And like to give examples, I think Bohm, uh, for some reason with him, whenever we have any trade that's even close to remotely getting done, it's 
no conversation. I send him a trade offer. He'll either counter or accept or decline. And if he does counter, he'll at least send me a text back and be like, hey, like, I, I, I'm not feeling that. Or I, I, don't, I don't see there's any value in me texting him ahead of time and saying, hey, I'm kind of interested in Terrace Marshall. Like, in, in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong, but the way that our relationship works is I think he thinks I'm trying to pull the wool over his eyes every time we have a trade conversation. So I don't want to have a trade conversation with him. I just raw dog him a trade and I just say, take it or leave it. I'm not going to try to explain to you why this is good or bad. You're, you're knowledgeable enough to figure it out for yourself. You know that I'm knowledgeable enough to have an ulterior motive. I'm not going to try to explain to you what I'm thinking. Just <laughs> take it or leave it. Whereas with James, Printy, Printy, the Beavers, I'll send them a raw dog trade offer, but then I'll send them a text say, hey, he sent you this trade. Here's why I sent this. You don't have to accept, obviously. <laughs> but this is my this is my logic. But please hit accept or decline because I don't want this to sit out there for a week and at least get them to look at their app. With Dan or you, it's Dave. You have Tanks Bigsby. I have Travis Etienne. Let's get a deal done. Don't bullshit me. You know how I think about him. You know I think he sucks. I know you know he sucks, and I know you're gonna try to milk me for more than anybody's worth. But let's like come to an agreement. Or Dan, it's like. You have the 201. I have this. I know you don't want a player this year because you're building for 2026. I have a 2026 second. How do we bridge the gap between the 201 and the 26 second? And we'll go back and forth and talk and we'll throw out all these ideas around. Well, if this is worth this, then you should accept this trade, right? Or this. So like, I feel like knowing your managers and building that trade rapport helps me figure out whether I should just raw dog them, <laughs> send them a good morning text or whether I should take them to dinner first. <laughs> no, I do, you're, you, you, that's a really good way to think of it. I do. I do agree. There are certain managers like Dan and I have just sometimes text each other and just be like, all right, let's spend a couple hours just making a trade. And yeah. it's, there's no intention in doing anything. It's just like, and that's honestly how the CMC thing happened initially was like, we were just texting <clears> and it led to, you want to make a trade? It was like, fuck yeah. And then we looked at both our rosters like, we both it's either need to go all in or all out. And I was like, Dan, I even put in Dan's camp. I was like, Dan, I will let you decide. You can either decide, do you want all my assets? That's such a good straight sales tactic. You decide. You let a horse to water and he ate sand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Dan, you can go all in. I, I will give you these like five guys, or you can give me these four or five guys and we'll make a deal the other way where you're acquiring picks and doing all this shit. And sure enough, he was he he decided like nah man like I think it's best if I go for the rebuild. It's like all right, like fine. And so, um, and then we already made that deal. But that is a really good point. There is there is a few managers like you, him, and, and maybe one other that you can really just go to them. And be like I want to make a trade for this person. Like or like you need this, I need that. Let's just come to Jesus, realize that, and finally make something happen, kind of thing. I do really appreciate that because you know pretty quickly, even if you do in both actually want to make a trade, you know within 15 minutes if you're so far worlds apart, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then you also know if you make it kind of past that 15, 30 minute mark and you've gone back with 12 offers, you're like, all right, we're going to make a deal done. Eventually, it's just what's the deal going to be? Right. And Who's going to concede? Like, what do I need to do to get this yeah. done? And there's no hard feelings either way. Like there's plenty of times too with you, me, or me and Dan, where we just haven't made the deal because it just we quickly we realize like, yeah, we're too far off. Um, yeah. And then we do the same thing a week later for some. All right. So this is good. So this again, part of the soft skills is I think trade quality initially is important. And I've said I'm not asking you to expose all your trade strategies, but you know I think it's since we're having an episode on it, it's not just for us. It's like. How, how do you like when you're sending the initial offer, especially raw dogging, how do you, what do you like that offer to look like? Like, are, do you send a real low ball just to test the waters? Do you like to send your best offer first and just be like, I think this is, I can't do any better. Or do you send like a take it or leave it type offer? I mean, like, this is the most I'm going to give you take this offer or leave it or don't like shut the fuck up. Like, do you, are yeah. you change manager to manager? Like, how do you feel? I never start with a take it or leave it. Uh, I do get to that point with a lot of managers though um for for most of them i try to bring a trade that is pragmatic and on paper probably pretty close usually where the ambiguity rises is where the, again they love x y and z player either because it is a core player to them that they're just like i really don't want to move them so they have a 20 percent premium and then that's just like do i want to pay or do i not 
or um, they just actually inherently value X way more than I do. Um, and so usually that's where the discrepancy starts. But I would say I kind of do more of a bullshitty offer on people that are either super risky or someone I don't really need or want. I'm just kind of like trying to again, have some action moving around, uh, having some trade action. Um, but no, traditionally, I try to send a trade that's like realistically should be accepted. You know, it shouldn't be, especially especially over the year. Let's say at the beginning, I probably was a little more, <clears throat> excuse me, heavy handed with like maybe too egregious. Um, but now over the years, I've tried to position myself for <clears throat> more. It is like it's a realistic trade. It's a real trade. If you accepted it, I would still make fun of you. But like, it's not that bad kind of thing. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of how I view it. Uh, I think you made a really good point about the quality of the player dictates the initial trade strength. Because if I'm going out there and I'm trying to get a guy like, again, using him as an example, Tank Bigsby, who, truthfully, I could not care any less whether I get Tank Bigsby or not. But if I'm like, I want to get a trade done, I'm going to kick off the absolute bare minimum worst trade possible offer that I'm like, okay, I'll send you a fourth and 69 fab. Just to see if you're like, fuck, I'm just dying to get, I'm going to drop Tank Bigsby this week. So the fact that I'm getting anything, I'll accept. Now, if I'm going for Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, I'm going to be very careful around that initial trade offer. Around, I want to make sure I send an initial trade that, again, to go back to a calculator, if they plug it in to keep trade cut, they're not going to say, Joe is a fucking asshole. Now, that doesn't mean it's the best trade offer I'll make. But when I'm talking about, any high quality asset, I am making a legitimate offer that at least looks passable, especially given their team construct, especially if I know that team's rebuilding or that team is com contending. Yeah. Calvin Ridley, Amari Cooper in a first probably is not enough for Am Amon Ross St. Brown, but that manager can craft a narrative around, okay, I'm getting two startable receivers for one and I'm getting a pick. It's not the best offer I can make. If they're interested at all in any of those pieces, I'm ready to talk about them. But I'm not giving them a, yeah, I'll give you Amari Cooper in a second for Amon Ra. Like, I'm not trying to like make this guy delete my number. Uh, I think it's really important that I don't think a lot of managers realize how the relationship building part of trading is so important around like, if you make me constantly feel like a dumbass when you send me a trade offer, it makes me less inclined to bridge the gap between us on a trade that we might be close. If you constantly make me a trade offer that makes me feel stupid, and then when you actually come to me week 10 and you're like, dude, I really need a quarterback. Like, what do I got to do well, to get Jared Goff? I'm going to say, dude, fuck you. Pay me two first. I'm not fucking helping you. And a key piece <laughs> around that too, though, is understanding the other thing I've been trying to do a lot of, and it just paid off handsomely uh, the other day, was... Um, sending a trade like just basically putting someone on the trading block and just saying like hey taking the best offer i'm moving them <laughs> end up getting a third for um oh, darren waller darren wall <laughs> <laughs> from That's a notoriously cool. like really tough trade person to trade with and so i think it's just like again like you never know someone's value on things but i also have found where if they're the one that wants the trade to happen and want to initiate it they're always willing to pay more Whereas if you're the Ooh. one sending it, they're always willing to pay less. That's a good point. And so whenever you can start to draw them out to make that trade offer to do things. Um, and it's almost like what we did with Dan. Like we basically told Dan, like, yo, Michael Pittman's trash. Like you need to get rid of him. He's trash. Don't do it now. Don't do it now. You got to wait to like week four of the middle of the season and trade them. Do not do it now, but he's fucking trash. And then Dan like had a panic party and he decided this week if he doesn't <laughs> move, I'm gonna die. And like my wife will not respect me anymore. And so like he just decided that all right, I gotta I gotta move Michael Pittman for whatever whatever I can get. Um but yeah, you know, there's there's all the psychological things you can do there too to like almost make them realize, oh yeah, this person kind of sucks. Um like it's gonna yeah. be with you and C D, like C D holding out historically, people that hold out do really bad that season, seasons following. Dak's leaving. You're going to have Trey Lance. CD's probably pretty trash. Maybe move him. Yep. Uh, any second right now, he's gone. Um, but yeah, no, I think you made a good point there is that 
and I have never thought of it until I thought of it while you were talking around. If someone comes to you with a trade, they're willing to pay more. I think the, the manager who's willing to say no has all the leverage. If I, if you're willing to say, mm, I'm good, you automatically gained an extra second of value just by saying no. Like, again, it can backfire. It's not a fucking foolproof system because I'm also one to say, truthfully, I'm like, this is the best most I'm willing to pay. If you can get more for this guy, by all means, go give him to someone else. I'm not paying any more than this. So if you want to get this deal done, this is the best I'm going to give you. But more often than not, I make an offer that says, I'm willing to drop this one little tiny component of the trade to get it done. If that's all that it's going to take, or I'm willing to add a third or I'm willing to add a. And Dan is the master of this, of saying, Hey, we've been talking for two hours. I love this deal. Can you throw in your third in 2027? And it's just like, Oh my fucking God, fine. Just take it. Like, and that's the little bit. And it's like, this gets to the next point. We just talked about how sending the initial offer quality is important. And we kind of talked about our strategies where like, I send probably usually typically 80 to 90% of my max offer, unless it's like, you know, a premium blue chip piece where I probably send my max offer almost right away or above that. Um, what, how do you respond to receiving an offer, an offer, obviously good or bad? Let's start with the good. When you receive a good offer, an offer that fits the criteria that you want, regardless of asset quality, are you just smashing accept when it fits the billy? Are you trying to milk some more? Or oh, Always trying to milk more. You got to always see, okay. you never want to, um, one of the worst feelings in negotiations is when you make an offer to someone and they instantly accept. Really? 100%. Because I, and it's funny you say, because if I see a trade, someone makes an offer for something that I was like contemplating ever trading uh, and it matches. No, 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 hold on, hold on. You're, you're missing, sorry, misconstruing it. Oh, you're saying when you make an offer and they accept right away. I'm offering Wilson for a third and me smashing right. it instantly. He's always going to walk away from that and like, wow, I fucked that up. Because I right. probably could have gotten more from someone. Oh, which is why when you receive an offer, you like, you don't just smash accept because you're like, I wonder if I could get more. Well, when I receive, I yeah, well, receiving is easier to smash accept. I would just say, I was just saying that if you're the person offering it and they instantly accept, I always know I fucked up. Um, but yes, if, if I receive an offer, unless I really think, unless I really think it's an overpay, an, an underpay from my side, I guess, because they're offering it to me. Unless I really think it's an underpay, I'm always going to try to milk more. Um, you don't I worry about trade relationships? Like if someone makes you a fair offer and you're like, oh, I could probably get more, but also I like the trade. I'm just going to hit accept. No. <laughs> no, fuck them. Fuck them managers. Uh, no, I mean, it's not a, I, I, I don't make it contentious. Like I just want to know where that boundary is. So I know, okay, you're willing to walk away. If I say it's, you got to add the 2027 20, fourth or deals off, you know? And so I think there's, I think there's credibility to it too, right? Like if we're talking about 2027 fourth on both sides, the fact that I would draw the line there, like if you don't give me your 27, 27 fourth, I'm walking away. And for him that he would walk away because he wouldn't add it. It's like on both sides, it's pretty fucked up. (laughs) Like if it's material, if it's like, Hey, you need to add your 2025 third or your 2025 second to this, or I'm walking away. Well, that's material. And and that also does leave room though for him to say, all right, hey, I can't do my 2025 second, but I can do my 2026 second. Or I can't do my 2025 third, I can do my 2026 third and my 2024 second, you know, some 2027 mm-hmm. second, whatever it is. Um, so to me, it's like being pragmatic with it, like to not to, to be a Dan where it's like, yo, you gotta add 40 fab. Well, what if no, I'm not in 45? Well, if you don't have 45, I'm fucking walking away. Like <laughs> so there's levels to this shit. Um but no, so when I receive an offer, I almost always am. At first, I'm just my first analysis is just going to be like, okay, am I underpaying, or overpaying? And just in my gut, and that's the only time I've really just smashed an untalked about deal was the Michael Wilson one. Every other deal, or it wasn't even, it wasn't even it was Rondell Moore. I say right. mine was. I was Michael Wilson. I just thought I, I sent you the Michael, Michael Wilson. Wilson. Yes, it was Rondell Moore, um, and so uh, that's the only time I've smashed except super fast every other time it's been okay like let me think about it let me hum and haw on it i will say more often than not the other big thing i try to do most my good trade offers have come in text message i always say if you want like whenever i get a good one just if you're listening and you're in the league if you send me a pretty fair like i'm actually humming and hawing over it i will make you send it in the app 
because then it's all the ball is now in my court. Well, oh, on, I, shot. but if you're sending me the offer now, it's okay. It's not me waiting on you. It's my decision to decide. Okay, yes or no. And I'm so, so glad you said this. So I, I cannot always, stand that. Yeah. So I will always force you to do it so that it's balls in my court. But then that way I know one, your offer to me truly was serious because you're willing to put it in the app. But that's just so you know, that means I'm literally sitting on like, am I pressing yes or no? Like maybe I didn't want to add a little more to make me actually want to say yes, but I am so close in that trade is when I make you put in the app. <clears throat> Dude, a hundred percent. It that that speaks volumes to being a good trade manager around if me and you are talking and finally we come up like, okay, I'll do Henry in a first for a chain, whatever it is. And I'm like, Fuck, I don't know. I really shouldn't do it. I really should do it, but I don't want to do it. And I'm like, fine. Like, just, you know what? Fucking send it. Like, let me see it. And then you go, uh, actually make it a chain in a second. Right then and there, you just lost me as a trade partner for life. Not for life. I'm exaggerating, but like right that you agreeing to a trade via text. And then when I say, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then you saying, oh, now that I got you to say yes, can you add this thing? A complete opposite to what Dan did. This is once you've agreed on a trade and then yeah, yeah. I say yes, and then you ask me for more. I don't even, the whole trade is dead to me. I don't care how close of a good player was. I'm totally done with that trade. The second you say yes, and then ask for a little bit more. I, out of principle, I will fucking delete your phone number from my phone and block you on my space. I almost, I will say not to call him out, but that's where Trevor and I got. I have to go back to check to text to, to actually confirm it, but I feel like we had a yes. And then the very last second, he was just like, Well, can you add Brock Purdy? And I'm like, No. And he's like, Well, I'm not doing it without Brock Purdy. And I'm like, What the yeah. fuck? Like, dude, we had a yes. Like, and I'll, I'll have to confirm a text. I don't want to call him out publicly. I guess I kind of am, but. It, no, it, that negotiation was out. one of the most exhausting things because he was like so MIA for half the day. And I was like, I had other people I was talking trades with for like pieces, not the right. Whole and we're mid draft, and you're like, dude, yeah. we're on the clock. We're mid draft on the clock. I'm trying to do other silo deals with like one of the guys here, two of the guys here. This guy's sitting on it that has to mean the best value for my team going forward. But like, I want to just lock it in if we're going to lock it in or just ax it if we're going to ax it. It was exhausting. And so. I will also say, hey, if you're actually going to go through with a big negotiation, you have to be willing to go through the exhaustion. Like you can't get frustrated because <clears throat> once you get frustrated and exhausted, they win, and you know you're going to overpay. <laughs> the and, communists win. <laughs> and I will say, like I slightly did overpay in that trade because of my fear of the players I had and my fear of what my team could look like at the end of next season. It would yeah. just be decimated. And so I made a bet. Like I was like, all right, I'm willing to lose a little bit on this trade because. I didn't I didn't want to deal with my team what it what could potentially look like in 2025. Sorry. Um so the I have a couple more points and we're done. Yeah, we're on episode's getting on. Let's uh, Yeah, we're yeah, looking at our 2 hours. Um so how do you <laughs> so what's your ta- strategy for responding to a bad trade offer? Because I think this is something that again we've talked about a little bit is there's clearly people and managers in our league that respond differently. Brian doesn't answer. He just says, that's a bad trade. I'm not even going to grace you with a response. Dan will give you a five paragraph essay, MLA yeah. formatted, cited, and passed through the Surgeon General explaining why, hey man, I appreciate the offer, first and with, foremost. With a link to, with the link to KTC. Yeah, just explaining his logic and why his logic has founded scientists who agree with it. And then there's Austin, who will actually make you think you <laughs> stabbed his grandmother. Be when you sent the op- you I sent the offer to him and I threw a rock through his window with the offer attached to it and <laughs> makes me feel like the worst piece of shit on the face of the earth. Brent, very similarly. Uh, Max might give you a good little joke on the side and be like, but also, why would I do that? And makes you explain, which is a really savvy way of getting you to expose your values. Um, so I'm just curious. Like, when you get a- I, did, I did extract that from Max. That's how I got Tank Dell. Yeah. So like, how do you respond to a bad offer? Like a really, really uh, an offer that you you couldn't be bothered. Like, there's no even counterable thing you could send back. Do you have a strategy that is a one size fits all, or do you feel like you approach it differently with every manager based on the player? Well, or so actually, so so a point there. That's what I was going to say on the max thing. That's how I capitalize on max. So just as a, just a side note, I sent him a first for Debo. I didn't think he would accept it. And he kind of laughed and was like, dude, like, why am I going to do a first for Debo? And I was like, all right, they'll do it for Tank Dell. He's like, you would do Tank Dell in a first for a first? I was like, yeah, sure. 
I was like, I need a wide receiver. I want a young receiver receiver. And he's like, all right, fine, send it. And he's accepted it. <laughs> and so you can capitalize on that if you know the manager's gonna react, right? Because they like they're okay getting a first. They're like no one's gonna not want to get a first. Right. There's but no bad in- first. People but, who but down talk first are idiots. Right, but you're implanting into their head that they're paying too much for their top guy. Well, guess like it's almost in the Nico, right? So if I yeah. can be with CD in a first or whatever, say it was two first, and you're like, dude, I'm not doing a CD for two first. It's like, all right, what about Nico? Mm-hmm. You're gonna be two first for Nico? Like, yeah, sure. Right. You, it's like seems like I'm getting a deal when it's like yeah market value. But if I came to you an issue with two first for Nico, be like, ah, I don't know. Why are right. you coming with two first with Nico? Right. What do you know that I don't know? Exactly. So you're taking it on the secondary because you're being like, hey, I came for your main guy with a not a egregious trade, but like a pretty I, I'd probably win the trade on paper. And then they're like, nah, 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 that's crazy. And then you give them the other guy you actually wanted for the same value. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa that kind of seems like an overpay now. And I'm winning. All right, great. Except. Um, so uh, so on how I receive bad trades, I used to receive them poorly. Um, and it was just like, dude, like, what the fuck are you thinking? I was almost in the Austin Brent camp, probably. I don't really remember six years ago. Um, but I can imagine I would be like that. And now I've pivoted to just being like, all right, like, what are you really looking to get? Or I'd come back with like, hey, okay, that you made that offer for CMC at the time. I'll do it for Eckler or I'll do it for Elijah Mitchell. I don't know. And just a way to be like, your trade's not like I'm in, like, it's basically me trying to show I'm interested in your pieces, but at this guy, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the question mark as you're looking at um, the player pool and what they're offering. Picks is really easy because, again, look what I said earlier. Picks are a crapshoot. You don't really know what they're worth or what they're worth. You just kind of have to go off of like, all right, what round is it and what year is it? And I have a rough value on it. Otherwise, it doesn't really It's matter. the only thing that is guaranteed to appreciate in value, no matter what. Unless it goes from being what should be the 104 to the 112. The only sure. way it loses value if you thought it was a top six first and it goes on to win the league. Sure. So, but anyways, so those are always ambiguous. Once you start putting in players right and it's a bad trade well i just might like you're if you had offered me nico and rashad i don't think there could have been any deal that i would have been like yeah i'll take nico and rashad like that's that's the level that i was at with them that would be anywhere that's even close that you'd accept it right if you gave me like hey i'll give you nico and rashad for brandon cooks and elijah mitchell fine i'll take that deal (laughs) like thank you realistically (laughs) realistically there was no way at any way shape or form i was going to give up the assets probably required to acquire those players to meet your value and want those players on the back end so right there's a there's a point there what i was saying like picks is one thing where like you can always find a, re- a deal for picks and the right player that you're willing to offer for that and i'll be less insulted on that when it comes <clears> to <throat> players i'm going to politely try now go back and say hey what what are you more interested in moving those players or acquiring my players that you're coming after because if they're like no i want cmc okay well now i know you want cmc let's build a trade around him that i the, the stuff i want That's if you really wanted to move Devonte adams and dj Moore, okay now i know you want to move them here's what i'm willing to give you for those things so it's really trying to find out what's the person trying to do are they trying to acquire the players that you have specifically or they're trying to specifically move the players that they have because usually it really boils down to they want one of those things to happen it's rare they want both and that's where it's a tough thing, right? Like for me, with the with the, with the trade we talked about before, the Laporta trade, <clears> I <throat> wanted to move CMC and Adams in the same trade, and I wanted Laporta or a top three tight end that was young on my team. And so, dude, and I've wanted- never never thought of that truthfully, and that is such a good way of thinking about when someone makes you a trade offer. It's still a, a Sudoku puzzle because. You have to, you don't necessarily have to decipher it, but it would be helpful if you could decipher whether they're actually trying to get your player or they're just trying to get rid of their player. Like there is so much more to it than, hey, I really want uh, Puka Nakua versus I'm actually just trying to trade away Drake London. I'm making you an offer of Drake London for Puka Nakua, but is it because I just want I'm afraid of Drake London or is it because I really want Puka? It could be both, obviously. And they're never one's ever going to admit that, like, oh, I actually don't care if I get Puka or not. I just really want to offload London at his market value. And no one's ever going to say, oh, I just really want Puka and I'm willing to pay overpay for him for what I think his real value is worth. But what a good way of, of articulating that. Um, 
That was a, I think that that's was a week long negotiation class I took. I think, <laughs> I think that's a great way to end this episode. I did have another little segment on common trade types that I don't think it's worth going through. Which is one for one trades, tier ups, tier downs, time value pick swaps, big blockbusters, depth trades. And then layered team trades, which is in, uh, one, I guess I'll give it a little. I think there's a type of trade you can make where you own somebody's first and you're making a trade to improve a competitor's pick position to weaken your own first value so you get a better pick. That's like 40 chess. Um, but uh, let's, let's wrap it where we're at. At the end of the day, Dave, trading is it's so nuanced. It's It's so... It's so tough to, to explain. You know what? Trading is a lot like sex. You know, it takes it takes two of you, um, unless you're Brian Boehm, uh, then, it's, then, then it's just one of you. Um, or yeah, if it's if it's uh, if it's Austin, maybe it's three. Um, but typically, you know, trading benefits <laughs> both of you. Um, but at the end of the day, because trading is a lot like sex, you know. Even really, really bad trades are still fucking so much fun. And I'm just so happy to be a part of them. Honest to God, like at the end of the day, just being a part of a trade is all that matters to me. So get out there, make some trades, use protection. <laughs> <laughs> and with that note, <laughs> we're much your values from drafts and drafts. Yes. Thank you so much for all 243 fucking people who are here. What the hell? Yeah, that's so uh, awesome. Crazy, crazy attendance on the live stream. Thank you, everyone from Twitter or X that is here. We are exclusively streaming on X right now uh, for this stream. We might try out YouTube next time because unfortunately we can't see any comments or have people talk. And you know, I think that's a really great thing for us to have in episodes at times. Um, but we're going to be doing this. We, we do podcasts about every week. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, etc. Um, but genuinely, thank you so much for coming in. I want to give a couple shout outs to people that I tagged and like messages out to. So one, PDFDL, our league. Thank you guys for coming in. If any of you showed up, hopefully you fuckers did. Uh, also want to shout out uh, Spo Banana Society. Um, quick shout out to them. They do blockchain based uh, fantasy leagues. Check them out. They do best ball tourneys where you can actually sell your team. What was that called? Season. Spoiled Banana Society. Uh, okay. But you can actually sell your team midseason. Um, so like you own you own basically the right to the team so you can sell that team if they're really high performing in the middle of the season for whatever value you want to um, but it's fully on chain best ball really cool and you, and you draft essentially the the player position so you get like the new york jets qb1 for that week you get their points so it could be a different player you're not drafting oh the player, you're drafting the that's cool of that player that finishes there so really really cool thing i haven't done a draft yet i'm due for one maybe even do a draft uh with them at some point but a lot of content to come out going into the to the draft season. Um, and genuinely just thank you all for attending and, and coming in for the live stream. And this was a lot of fun. And since so many of you showed up, hopefully we'll be back doing it again real soon on, on X. Yeah. Big kisses. Right. See you, buddy. <laughs> Bye.